Good evening. Good evening, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to be back here again. I think some of you may recall that I was here um, three years ago, perhaps four years ago, whenever it was, as a member of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And my uh, time here, uh, there's one area I will talk about was in Fukushima Daiichi. There's a little bit more to talk about. And one area we did focus on was on nuclear safety. And um, as you heard in um, the introduction, um, I also, in the past, was head of the U.S. Department of Energy's Nuclear Research and Development Program. So this position with the NEA has been an opportunity to bring those pieces together and to um, bring them together in a way to think about the future of nuclear technology and nuclear, nuclear energy. And in that respect, it's a great pleasure to be back in uh, Argentina, a place where um, interest in the long-term future of nuclear technology has been very vibrant for many years and continues to this day. Um, what I'd like to do is to give a very, um, I'll, get, I'll try to go through this very relatively quickly, an overview of a few thoughts regarding the work that the NEA is doing, um, and then to hopefully have a good discussion with you today. Um, so with that, I'll just uh, start to go through this. And just, Thanks, sir. Um, I think to begin, uh, just a very brief introduction of the NEA. Now, as, um, as, as you've heard, the, the OED, there is an interest among um, the, government, the government of Argentina to join uh, the OECD, um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And um, within the context of the OECD, the NEA, the Nuclear Energy Agency, is a semi-autonomous um, agency well, with a separate membership, a separate budget structure, and um, we are a very technical organization. Our, our mission, as you can see here, in over 31 member countries, is to, um, to be an organization to foster cooperation and discussion among uh, the advanced nuclear uh, countries in the world, and in particular, focusing on, on issues such as safety and technology, nuclear waste, and I'll, I'll show you some of that. Uh, the 31 member countries um, were shown on the flags here. Um, most of the NEA uh, countries are OECD countries as well. The exception is Russia, which is a member of the NEA, not a member of the OECD. And among the OECD countries, which are 35, uh, five um, OECD countries are not members of the NEA. And, uh, but for the most part, there's a great deal of commonality between the membership. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, we do most of our work in the auspices of a series of standing committees. And these are committees of, of high-level experts and, and officials from member governments uh, that deal with, uh, uh, you can see this chart, uh, we have two committees that deal with, uh, the one committee deals with nuclear safety, uh, nuclear regulatory activities, radioactive waste management, radiation protection, nuclear law, uh, development, economic analysis, nuclear science. And we also have an organization called the Data Bank, which is a, a, a library of computer codes, computer data that's used by researchers around the world. Um, these, uh, these committees um, have representatives from each other country and they discuss um, how we can cooperate, how we can advance state-of-the-art technology. And to show you what some of the detail of the committee looks like, I chose nuclear science as a good example. Each of our committees has these has a subsidiary bodies, expert groups and working groups of technical experts who can be from other, uh, not from government, but can be from research organizations, can be from universities, uh, can be from a wide range of, of places. <clears throat> and their mission is to look into great detail at the technical subjects of, of interest. In the case of nuclear science, um, you can see we have expert groups on um, minor actinide management, <coughs> on accidental fuels, on uh, multi-scale modeling of fuels and structural materials, very technical subjects. And, and yet the committees all have this kind of, of, of substructure. And altogether, there's about 75 different um, committees uh, and subgroups that meet under the auspices of the NEA uh, to pursue these agendas. And so obviously we have hundreds and hundreds of scientists who come to any meetings over the course of the year, and all their work is um, memorialized in a series of technical reports, which are made available uh, free of charge on our website. <coughs> Excuse me. Um,
In addition to the committee's uh, activities, we also uh, are the home for a variety of separately funded activities. Uh, the oldest of which is the Generation 4 International Forum. Um, I was actually the first chair of the Generation 4 International Forum when it was formed about uh, 15 years ago. And that is an organization that is designed to uh, foster cooperation among interested countries to develop uh, a vast number of technologies for the long term future. As you can see, the, the, the goals are to improve sustainability, economics, safety, reliability, proliferation resistance, and fiscal protection of nuclear power. And the Generation for National Forum <coughs> broadly is approaching uh, six different types of reactor technologies. But within those six, there's also a great deal of work on things like uh, materials issues, coolants, fuel issues, so a lot of technical subjects covered by that. Uh, as a matter of fact, Argentina was a founding member of the Generation 4 National Forum when it was first assembled. Um, has not been very active in the Generation 4 National Forum for, for many years. I'm very hopeful that uh, that will change as we go forward. Um, another one of our uh, internal, another organization is the Multinational Design Evaluation Program, uh, something I think will be of great interest uh, going forward for Argentina because the Multinational Design Evaluation Program, MDEP, is uh, the, an organization that brings the regulators from our member countries together to analyze state-of-the-art technologies. For example, the Ariva EPR um, is the subject of the study under MDEP. The regulators work together and they try to have common positions and common approaches to analyze the safety of these, uh, of these various technologies. So the EPR uh, from Ariva, the vast point water reactor from Japan, uh, VVR 12, 1200 from Russia, uh, and, uh, and the most, and there's a proposal from China for the Mulong 1 uh, design, the HPR 1000, to be evaluated by MDEP as well. So this is something that is growing and um, is, is something that has uh, considerable interest. Uh, finally, just last year we had the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, which actually is meeting in Buenos Aires tomorrow. Uh, we're looking forward to the conference that's being sponsored by IFNEC. IFNEC is a very different type of organization. It is more policy-oriented and less technical than the others. Um, it brings together uh, the highly developed, experienced countries like France and, uh, and Korea and Japan, uh, along with countries that have uh, much, much less experience but have aspirations to deploy the power of the future, such as countries in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, so a very, very broad range of countries participate. There's altogether 66 countries within NIFNEC. Um, a very important feature of the NDA is that uh, we are one of the, probably the only international organization that has as much flexibility as we do to form um, international joint projects, joint undertakings. Uh, really, any of our member countries that are interested can form um, a cooperative activity to analyze and investigate really almost any, any technical subject. And uh, we have 21 joint projects currently underway, looking as you can see this chart, nuclear safety issues, nuclear science, rewrite waste management. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Holden Reactor Project in Norway. That is actually one of our oldest projects. It's now only 50 years old. It's been ongoing for all this time. As a specific example on the newer activities, I, I thought it was worth pointing out the, the BSAF, the benchmark study of the accident of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. This is a very interesting uh, project because what this project has done is it's decided, to, to, the countries have decided to work together to look at um, the technology that we've had over many years to analyze how severe accidents work in the nuclear power plant. What actually happens when you have a core dump disaster in the nuclear power plant? So we have these computer simulations that, that analyze what actually happens in great detail during this year accident. But we've never actually had an opportunity to test those uh, codes. <clears throat> so these various codes from different countries, there's US codes, French codes, um, uh, Russian codes, um, have been uh, used to try to replicate what happened in Fukushima Daiichi and then to compare the results of the codes to what we actually saw happening at the plant. And we also compare the codes with each other, and as a result, we've been able to understand how accurate these codes are and how they can be used um, in the future to make uh, 
the technology even safer. Um, the next step of this is actually even more interesting. Now that we've seen that there's very good agreement among the codes and the results they get in looking at Fukushima Daiichi, we're now going to run the codes a bit further to try to predict, without having the data, the actual data, predict exactly where did the melted core material go inside of the damaged reactors. And this will be used to help uh, the Japanese government as they try to clean up this, 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 these damaged reactors. Um, and I, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about Fukushima Daiichi because, uh, and for those of you who were here when I was last year, I used this exact same picture because I like this picture. <coughs> um, although the context will be a little different today. Uh, Fukushima Daiichi obviously was an event that has had significant impacts around the world. Um, the, there's been tremendous expenditures by power, uh, by uh, companies around the world to learn, learn the lessons from Fukushima Daiichi to try to um, fix any of the, uh, the, um, the gaps that might have existed in our regulatory infrastructure and operational infrastructure. And a lot of very, very good work has, has, has happened over the years. And, you know, soon after the accident, the, the NEA um, issued this report, uh, which, is, which was designed to look at the accident and to try to, in those earlier days, this report came about a year after the accident, <coughs> to anticipate what the basic lessons were from the accident. And uh, very clearly, um, one of the things that I think that any number of countries determined was that there was nothing about the Fukushima Daiichi accident that taught us anything particularly new about nuclear technology. There weren't any su major surprises in, in some fashion. Um, in particular, the, the scenario that the Fukushima plant endured, which is known as the station blackout, is a very classic um, failure mode for a nuclear power plant. If you want to see a nuclear power plant get in trouble, take all the power away. And that's basically what happened with Fukushima Daiichi. And so, in understanding that, uh, NEA member countries said after the accident, uh, including, including countries such as Germany, which later decided to phase out nuclear power, that the, the nuclear power plant just said, and that was a very important statement. But um, I think one lesson that was learned is that we do our best to prepare for uh, whatever contingencies might happen in the power plant to try to anticipate you know, what or what what earthquakes should we prepare the power plant for? Because we're going to do very site specific analysis when we decide to get the power plant to try to prepare for what are the floods that could be experienced. Didn't know I had any stereo. Yeah. Um, the, the, what kind of flood might be necessary to anticipate? What kind of storms might take place? But what I think Fukushima taught us is that we have to be a bit more humble than that because you know we don't try to design nuclear power plants to deal with every conceivable natural disaster. You know, if we, we design nuclear power plants uh, to deal with perhaps the 500-year design basis event. But what happens if the million, once the million-year event happens next week, what do you do then? That really is the key lesson, I think, in Fukushima. And what we have done in response to that is really one of the most important developments in nuclear power in a very, very long time. Something else, and we're, we're still working on this, and this is, this is probably you know, a much harder area to deal with than the second area, and that is, it isn't just the physical infrastructure. It isn't just the design of the plant that's important. It's really the, the weak spot, I think, that we currently still have are the people. Um, we, we, we are the least reliable component of a nuclear power plant in some fashion, because if people um, are well-trained but still don't do their jobs, still don't do the things they're supposed to, don't make the right decisions, don't, um, don't report them, weaknesses that they see or problems that they find, we can find ourselves in trouble very, very quickly. So this is something that we have to spend a great deal of time on. And uh, after after I arrived at the NEA, we formed a new uh, division of the NEA called Human Aspects of Nuclear Safety. And we are spending a lot of time looking at issues such as safety culture and how we can make improvements in those areas. Um, despite the fact that they are not the sort of issues that can be very easily fixed by engineers. You know, some of these issues are more in the realm of sociologists and psychologists than they are in the realm of nuclear, nuclear physics and engineering. So it makes it more difficult to deal with, 
But I, I actually look at this as being extraordinarily important. And I believe that we have done such a good job of dealing with the, the, the vulnerabilities of every nuclear power plant um, in our member countries that the next nuclear accident, if it happens, will not be because of a physical failure of nuclear power plant. It will be because of a human failure, um, either the regulatory side or the operational side. So I think we have to do everything we can to try to address that. Um, so now it's been five years since the accident. And as I mentioned, we learned some important lessons. And so we have recently, <coughs> several months ago, issued this report, which is the uh, five years after the Fukushima Daiichi accident. And some of you may be familiar with uh, the report that came out of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, which is a very long, you have not seen it, it's literally about this big if you stack it up. It's a very large report uh, that looks in great detail about what happened at the accident. What, what, what were the failures, uh, who, who made mistakes, what were the issues, and it looks in great, great detail. What we did was we looked instead at, well, what have we done with all that knowledge? Now that we claim we've learned these lessons, what have we in the nuclear community done uh, to address that? And I won't go through all this in great detail, but the answer is we have learned an important lesson about these extreme events. And so what we have done in large respect is we have now taken steps to equip nuclear power plants around the world uh, with the ability to be more robust in the face of, of unexpected disasters. Uh, we, we've clearly reassessed all the hazards, but we also recognize we might be wrong, but we might see some very, very extreme event. So plants around the world um, have been given uh, these uh, special pumps to be able to move water into reactor vessels or into the spent fuel pools if all else fails. Um, there's more robust power supplies and layers and layers of power supplies. So if you lose power, there's still the ability to, to bring power to the systems and to cool uh, the, the reactor cores. There's better communications, there's better training. So all these things have been done to give more defensive depth to nuclear power plants around the world. And still at the last bullet there, we're still focused on the safety culture issues. These are things that have been done over the last five years uh, almost universally across uh, across the world, and uh, they they have given me and others uh, great confidence that nuclear power plants are even safer than they were uh, before. But we still have work to do in the safety culture area. Now, obviously, the fact that we've done all this wonderful work to make nuclear plants safer has not made everybody happy. Um, Obviously, in the last several years, we've seen uh, protests, we've seen moves to uh, phase out nuclear in some countries, we've seen um, a lot of questions that, that, that about the future of nuclear power, and um, you know, this, you know, this is a, a, a cover from Economist magazine that I think kind of encapsulates where a lot of people think uh, we are, and they think in this age of renewables with everyone focus on wind power and solar, uh, with economic, with the, with the effects of the financial crisis, making finance for large projects so difficult, the aftermath of uh, Fukushima. This is the view that I think a lot of people have had about nuclear energy and really, um, in a lot of venues of talking about energy or climate change, you don't really hear nuclear as prominently as you used to, and, and this is, I think, part of it. However, the reality is quite different. This, this is not our graphic. This is actually a graphic that was originated by the World Nuclear Association Industry Group. And, and I, could, I, I could quibble with the country here or there, but I think that the basic story is actually very straightforward. And the, what the basic story of this chart is, if you look at the, the blues and the greens, those are countries that think that there is a future for nuclear power. That, that's really the basic story. Um, the, the, the blues are countries that are, that are actually either building new plants or planning actively to build new plants. Uh, the greens are those that don't have plants today but want to, but want to build plants in the future. Um, so those blues and those greens are very, it's a very impressive story when you stand back and look at the world. The world basically has made a, a vote and the vote is nuclear power is here to stay. And you look at the countries where nuclear power doesn't have a future, and it's really highly concentrated in sort of the middle of Europe there. You know, it's Germany, it's Italy, it's a few other countries in that region. And the conversation in, in Europe is often very different from this around the rest of the world. 
And it's a very stark contrast when I go to, around the world and talk to people, um, not just in you know, the US and Canada, but you know, in Asia um, and other places, and including in countries like Argentina, where people are still talking about the future. So this is something that is very different. Um, and, and I think you know, this is a chart that, that captures um, you know, the estimates that we have uh, as of, I think, August. Yeah, August. Um, that we're now building, um, under, there's now under construction more nuclear power plants right now than there have been since the, the mid 1970s. So there's actually something of a building boom in, um, in, in nuclear right now. A lot is being driven by China, obviously. China's program is extremely large, um, and very vigorous. But it's not just China, it's also you know, many plants being built in Russia, the United States. <coughs> Um, Eastern European countries are building plants um, very, very aggressively. So there's a lot of programs around the world to, uh, to continue building nuclear power plants. Now, with all that said, um, th this is some analysis that comes out, out of the OECD. Um, you know, despite the fact that I, you know, there's lots of new nuclear power plants under construction, despite the fact that there's been huge investments. Um, I think I've heard of something in the order of some of the $300 billion, uh, billion dollars a year in renewable investment. Um, nevertheless, you can see we're still a carbon-based society. We're still burning a lot of fossil fuels, and uh, coal and oil and gas are still a predominant part of our energy infrastructure. Um, within that, uh, nuclear, among OECD countries, is the largest source of low-carbon electricity, um, and nuclear is the second largest low carbon source of electricity after hydro globally. But still, we have a very, very large um, investment going into um, hydrocarbons even today. Um, now, this is a very, this is probably one of the more important charts I wanted to show. This is actually also not from us, this is from our sister agency, um, the IE, the IE, International Energy Agency. And uh, we work very closely with the IEA in a lot of different um, activities. And in putting this chart together, they were asking a very simple question uh, from the standpoint of the, of the economists. If we want to really meet the objectives uh, set by COP21 to reduce um, the, the impacts of uh, carbon emissions to limit uh, global uh, temperature rises to two degrees C over pre-industrial levels, um, how do we do that? What does energy look like if we do that? And if you do it from a strictly economic standpoint, you get this chart. And as you can see in this chart, which says something very impressive to me, that you have to have a major increase in wind, a major increase in solar, um, a significant increase in use of carbon sequestration, which we don't even have yet. Um, and also, right in the middle there in blue, uh, a pretty significant increase in the and this chart basically says we would have to increase nuclear capacity globally by about two and a half times over what we have today, and which is a, roughly the equivalent of building about 500 new large nuclear power plants around the world. Um, that is a very impressive story. Now, let me also caution by saying that I don't believe this chart is a predictor of the future because. The chart, you know, I, I think you know, no, no, all of us have seen these projections by these experts over many, many years that say, here's what energy will look like in the future, 50 years from now, and um, you know, most of them can't really tell you what energy will look like next year, let alone 50 years from now. Um, so all this is kind of fantasy, in my, in my, in my view. However, what it does tell you is that there's a lot of different sources that we have have to rely on in the future. If we decide that nuclear isn't part of the picture, then you have to have that much more wind and that much more solar and that much more carbon sequestration. Or if carbon sequestration actually doesn't work out at all, then all these other things have to pick up the slack. So what this, what this chart tells you really is a very simple thing, that this is going to be very, very hard to do. That it's going to be very challenging and we're going to have to use basically every weapon at our disposal to even begin to approach these goals. So it's going to be a very, very challenging time. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, we see nuclear as playing a big role. There's a lot of countries that are moving in that direction. Um, however, we're really not making it at this point. You know, we look, look at 2014, 
um, which was the, the previous year. Now, I'm going to go to 2015 in a minute. 2015 was a good year. 2014 shows you more typically what we've seen in recent years, which is we're not connecting enough nuclear to really be able to even close, come close to these goals. Um, to, to make this work, as this chart shows, we would have to have had 20, 12 gigawatts of new capacity a year um, through 2020, um, and then have it even double beyond that from 2020 to 2030 in order to meet the, the two degrees C scenario. Uh, now, 2015 was a really good year, as a matter of fact. Um, in 2015, we actually came very close. This chart actually doesn't show 2015. I apologize for that. 2015 is actually a really good year because 2015, we actually got close to the goal. Uh, but I think that's the peak, and we're not going to see that in 2016. So that's something to watch. But this, but what you see in, in this chart is actually more typical of what we've seen over the last several years. We're not even close to being able to meet those targets. So why is that? Um, well, there's lots of reasons for that. And one of the things we do, we, we do is part of the OECDs, we're able to cooperate with other OECD organizations uh, to look at these broader issues. And one report, which is available on our website, um, you can download it at your, at your pleasure, is a, is, a, or is a report that we worked on called Aligning Policies for the Transition of the Low Carbon Economy. We did this with the IEA, the OECD, uh, the International Transport Forum. And the conclusion was actually quite interesting. And the conclusion was that if you look at the actual policies in the OECD countries, um, despite what governments say about climate change, the policies all run completely counter to what they say they want to accomplish. And so one, er one area in particular is the energy area. And the conclusion that was made uh, by the report is that current designs of wholesale electricity markets in many OECD countries are not strategically aligned with the low carbon transition. Um, let me save some time to just bring all these up. Uh, basically, what we found looking at this, and our subsequent analysis shows this, is that yes, there is a very good instinct to bring renewables into the market, and I think renewables are a good thing, but the way we have done it has actually had very negative impacts on electricity markets. Um, electricity prices in some parts of the OECD are, are, are so completely damaged that we see routinely um, zero cost electricity a marginal cost, and even negative cost to electricity um, in some parts. And when you have that happening routinely, that's not a functioning market anymore. This is the broken market. And we have broken markets over the OECD that are not generating revenues necessary to make the investments that we need in anything, including um, smart grid, which we talk a lot about. Um, and this is a big problem, and it's a very difficult problem because there's a lot of very um, there's great political interest in renewables, and so they're being forced in the market. And it's, being, it's being done in a way that's actually causing long-term damage to the markets, and we have to really resolve this. Otherwise, we're going to have significant problems in our long-term future. So this is a, a big issue that uh, we have to wrestle with. Um, this is a report, um, just to wrap this part of the conversation up. This is a report that we issued last year uh, jointly with the IEA, the Projected Cost of Journey Electricity, and this looked at these uh, biases um, against uh, low-carbon technologies, the fact that technologies like um, unsubsidized renewables or nuclear or anything else really have structural biases that, that make them be successful. Um, even renewables without, without subsidies don't do very well in the electricity markets, the way they're structured today. And the risks are so high that it really doesn't make sense for the private sector to make investments unless they get tech, unless they get significant subsidies from governments. Um, another issue we looked at is that for nuclear plants in particular, uh, project management issues. Actually, as we looked at projects around the world, were, at, were a bigger factor than we thought. And we found that the fact that in some countries they don't build nuclear power plants very regularly. If you build a nuclear power plant every every 15 or 20 years, you don't build the expertise in your country to know how to manage these projects effectively, and then you run into these problems. And for example, uh, the, sort of the infamous example, of course, is the project in Finland, uh, which is a, the Riva EPR that is um, about 10 years behind schedule and vastly over, over, over the, the cost target. 
And a lot of it had to do not with the, the sophisticated issues associated with nuclear technology. A lot of it had to do with the way you pour concrete. And so these management issues are very, very important. And they don't get the attention that I think they, they deserve. And I think in the US, when I was with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we saw that not only did we see project management issues in nuclear uh, projects in the US, which, which held things up to it, but we also found that the, the, the subcontractors, the suppliers for valves and, and pumps, uh, some of those, while we thought they had certification, turns out that they, they maintained certification, but their expertise base was very, very thin. And so when they actually had to implement um, you know, bringing parts and supplies to these power, nuclear power plant projects, they really weren't up to the job. And they had to use lots of rework. So these are things that you simply suffer with if you don't build nuclear plants on a regular basis. On the other hand, if you're China, Korea, Russia, and you're building nuclear power plants on a regular basis, you get really quite good at it. And so I think you look at the Korean project in the UAE to build uh, reactors in the UAE, they're very close to being on schedule and very much within their cost uh, targets. And they're doing quite well. So they show, that shows you that you can do this very well. And you see it's very similar things in China, very similar things in Russia. And, um, and it's a big challenge for, uh, for countries that don't build plants on a regular basis. So that's it, I should say. The US projects actually are going pretty well. A bit behind schedule, but not, not dramatic. They're actually going to kind of be very close to the cost targets. Now, I'm going to wrap up and talk about one last issue because it always comes up when you talk about nuclear, and that is nuclear waste. Everyone who look always brings nuclear waste up as a major barrier. And um, you know, I, I actually started my career in nuclear waste, so I, I've, I've, I've dealt with this for a long time. And I, you know, I, I have, I think, part of the issue with nuclear waste is how the public views it. And I have this very precise scientific experiment that I conducted where I went on Google and I typed in nuclear waste and put up images to see what shows up. And, um, well, this guy shows up. Um, he's, he's been very popular. I've done this for several years and this guy never goes away. I don't know why he's doing this, but uh, it looks very dangerous, but he's been doing it for a long time. But he's, uh, he's very popular on Google. Um, of course, you know, our old friend here, Homer, never goes away. He's very popular. Um, I have a new edition, which is this, this Canada do uh, you see there. Um, I like this one. I, actually, I think I know who that guy is. The guy with the eyeball coming out of his uh, finger. And uh, this this one I thought was actually quite nice. It's a cartoon with a man with his arm around his son looking at this giant folds of the way saying, one day, son, all this will be yours. And, and I, I think these, these images really capture uh, quite quite accurately what the public thinks about nuclear waste. And, and I think that when you're trying to cite nuclear waste, trying to get support for nuclear waste policies, the public had you know, all these images in mind that's so different from the reality of nuclear waste that it makes it difficult to make progress. Now, something that's going on in the world, which I think will help a great deal, is that there are some countries which actually have been making good progress towards establishing repositories. Uh, Finland in particular, I visited the Finnish facility a, a couple of years ago. It was very impressive. It's a deep geological repository. It goes about a half a mile, uh, 500 meters uh, or so under, under the surface in hard rock. And, um, and most of these look very similar. You dig deep down in hard rock, you dig, you dig these tunnels, and you put in, you dig um, silos, and you put the waste in a can, put it in the silo, backfill with clay, and you're, you're basically isolating that material from the environment for, for many, 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 many years. And we think this will work very well. Um, deep geological repositories are seen almost universally as a very practical and, human, and very doable way of disposing of nuclear waste. Um, and the, the technical issues are not insurmountable. They're actually very well understood. And I think we can do this very successfully. So Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, and France uh, I'm hopeful that over the next uh, decade or so, we will see successful projects, and that will help us when we're talking to the public about what to do with nuclear waste. Because today, many people in the public think we have no idea what to do with nuclear waste. And it's just not true. So if we have an example like this to point to, it will help a lot. Now, I would, one last thing I would point out is kind of interesting that when you look at this chart, you know, France is a little bit of an outlier, but you see these Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, what that they they're the countries that seem to have made such great progress. 
And I remember asking myself, well, why are they making such great progress? And someone gave me this chart and answered that question. And this is, uh, this is now several years old now, but it was done by the World Value Survey. And they asked a very basic question about uh, the perception of, of publics in various countries, which are, you know, can most people be trusted? And as you can see, the Nordic countries do really well with this. You know, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, they're all above 50%. Um, and then you kind of tail off from there. Um, I did notice that Argentina is not on this chart. I have no idea why that is. Uh, I'm not going to comment on it. I don't know what it would be in Argentina. Uh, but, but clearly, you know, to me, this says, this says something very important. I, I know that I've seen this in the United States, that the public has, in more, many, in more and more countries, simply don't trust the institutions and the experts the way they used to. You know, back in the back in the 50s and 60s, when you know, leading scientists um, said, you know, this is safe, this makes sense, you know, people paid attention to that. They were responsive to it. And today, uh, you really don't see it that this much. And I think in many countries, people think that you know, experts, you know, can't be trusted because they are biased. And if you find an expert that can tell you that it's safe, I can find you another expert that'll say it's not safe. And we, we see this in things like climate change. In some countries, climate change is not a debate. In my country, it's still being discussed as a debate. You find experts that say, well, it's really from solar activities or it's coming from something else. And, and so the public just doesn't trust experts who are used to. This is a, a significant issue. Now, one, area, one thing that the NEA um, does about this is we do have, um, as part of our human aspects and their safety activities, something called the formal stakeholder confidence. And this is a process um, that brings the experts and the public together for these discussions. And this has proven to be a very, very interesting and worthwhile activity. We've done that, 10 national workshops so far, just very recently, a, a month or so ago, in Bern, Switzerland. And um, it is not, you don't, you don't reach answers and conclusions, but what you do is you build confidence. And you, and you set up systems where, where people can talk to each other and to discuss these issues in a very open and non-threatening way. And I think it's one of the things that we can do uh, that's pretty very helpful. And the, the Bern workshop is actually quite interesting in that um, it was very unique that the Swiss decided to invite very young people to this. And there were, I think, 20 people that were between the ages of 16 and 25 that were um, spread around in these discussions. And it was really fascinating because when they were sitting at the table, these very young people, some of which were high school students, became kind of the center of attention because the, 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 the people, who the experts in the, in the public, people were, were looking at these young, these kids and basically saying, well, where do you get your information? What do you think when you hear it? Do you trust what you're, what you're hearing from the government? And the answers, were, I think, were very lucky to a lot of people. I mean, we certainly found out that the, the kids don't read newspapers. Though. That was one thing. Clear conclusion. They, they get a lot of their information off of uh, you know things like Facebook and, and, and other internet sites. But uh, but these kinds of processes, I think, are very important towards building the future. So I will um, stop there. Uh, this is a nice picture of our new headquarters building at the NEA. Uh, we moved uh, back in December to this nice building here. My office is actually one of the overlooks of the river there. So uh, come visit. We'll, we'll sit up and up and have some wine. But anyway, so again, um, thank you for inviting me to, to talk here. And um, well, let me, let me, let me before, before stopping, let me we'll sort of indicate that um, part of, a big part of our mission here has been to meet with government officials to talk about the potential uh, for Argentina to join uh, the Duke Energy Agency. Um, it's something, you know, an idea that I'm very excited about. I think Argentina is an excellent candidate to be a member of the NEA. Um, so we're looking forward to this discussion moving forward. Um, the NEA, uh, while we're under the OEC umbrella, does not require OEC membership to be a partner of the NEA. Um, so in the past, there have been several countries, such as Poland and Korea and a few others, that became the NEA members first, and then after some short period of time, uh, were in well positioned to be uh, OEC members. Uh, so this is a handshaking, and I think it should be looked at that way. And so we'll see how things develop. But uh, I'm very enthusiastic about Argentina being part of the NBA family, and uh, we'll work very hard to make that happen. So with that, thank you. Yeah.